Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Leinenweaver. I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And I'd like to welcome you to the Watson Institute for the panel today after Fidel. <coughs> As you may know, yesterday Fidel's, Fidel Castro's ashes were interred in Santiago de Cuba. He died 10 days earlier on November 25th at 10.29 p.m. He was 90 years old. Fidel Castro governed Cuba from 1959 to 2006 when he ceded power to his younger brother Raul, who's the current president. And at that point, the vast majority of Cubans had known no other leader. As many others have observed, after overthrowing Fulgencio Batista on January 8, 1959, Castro then held power longer than any other national leader living other than Queen Elizabeth. There isn't much I can say about Castro that you don't know already or that the four people sitting here will explain much more clearly than I can. So these four scholars will frame for us what Castro's death means for Cuba's future, for the Caribbean region, for Latin America, and of course for the United States as well. As Castro famously told Maria Shriver in 1998, it was an honor for such a small country as Cuba to have such a gigantic country as the United States live so obsessed with this island. So it's very appropriate for four scholars based in the United States to take some more time today to think, to keep on thinking about Cuba. So I'll introduce our four panelists now. Each of them will speak for about 10 minutes and afterwards they'll take questions from all of you. Daniel Rodriguez is the first speaker. Um, he's assistant professor of history here at Brown. He received his PhD from New York University in 2014, and his work examines the social history of public health, medicine, and disease in Latin America and the Caribbean, with a focus on early 20th century Cuba. He's currently working on a book called A Blessed Formula for Progress, the Politics of Health, Medicine, and Welfare in Havana, 1897 to 1935. And the book examines how struggles over disease and health shaped the lives of Havana's residents during the transition from colonial rule to independence. The second speaker is Brian Meeks. He's on the end there. He is professor and chair of Africana Studies at Brown. He holds a PhD in government from the University of West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. He came to Brown from the University of West Indies, where he was the director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. He's published 10 books and edited collections, including Critical Interventions in Caribbean Politics and Theory, Caribbean Revolutions and Revolutionary Theory, An Assessment of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Grenada, Narratives of Resistance and Envisioning Caribbean Futures, Jamaican Perspectives. His novel, Paint the Town Red, was published in 2003. Our third speaker will be Patsy Lewis. She is Professor of Regional Integration and Small States Development at the University of West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. And she's currently Visiting Professor of International and Public Affairs here at the Watson. She received her PhD in History from Cambridge University. Her research focuses on regional integration and international trade and small states development. She's published five books and edited collections, including most recently, Grenada, <coughs> Revolution, and Invasion. And our last speaker is Tony Bogues. He is the Asa Messer Professor of Humanities and Critical Theory, Professor of Africana Studies, and the Director for the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. He's also a visiting professor at the Center of Caribbean Thought in the University of West Indies, and an honorary professor at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. His PhD in Political Theory is from the University of West Indies. He's the author or editor of six books, including most recently Empire of Liberty, Power, Freedom, and Desire, and From Revolution in the Tropics to Imagined Landscapes, the Art of Edouard Duval Carrier. And I'd like to thank these four colleagues for taking the time today to think about Castro and Cuba with us, and I'm looking forward to learning from them. I also want to give special thanks to Brian Meeks, who had the idea to do this quick response panel. And we're thinking of this as the first of many conversations to be held here at Brown on this topic. So we look forward to continuing this dis discussion excuse me, in 2017. And I'd also like to inform you that this session is being recorded and live streamed so that you can revisit this afternoon's conversation in the months ahead by going to Klax's or the Watson's YouTube channel. And now, without further ado, I turn the floor over to Danielle Rodriguez. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so first, I'm a historian, so I'm probably better qualified to speak to the past than to quote what is next for Cuba and the region, which is the subtitle for today's. Sure, yeah. Uh, 
I'll speak up. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm a historian. Um, so I'm, I'm better qualified to talk to the past than to the future, uh, which is the subtitle for this panel. Um, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, as a, as a Cuban-American with a lot of family and friends on the island, and as an academic whose, whose research explores the social and medical politics of, the, of a previous transi transition, the transition from colony to republic, I'm deeply invested in this current political moment of transition and anxious, like many are, about the future of U.S.-Cuban ties. So um, to organize my 10 or so minutes of time here, I'd like to talk about the political reaction in the United States to the death of Fidel Castro, uh, focusing on the Cuban-American response. Um, and looking at how U.S. policy towards the island might change under a Trump presidency. Now, of course, for those of you that have been following um, the transition so far, it's, it's hard to, it's all rather unclear, um, uh, especially with any sort of policy questions with Donald Trump. Um, but between his political appointments and his ever-expanding archive of tweets, uh, we can make some educated guesses about where um, policy will lie with the Trump presidency. Um, so according to Cuban news sources, um, at 10.29 p.m. on November 25th, Fidel Castro died of natural causes. Shortly after midnight, his brother Raul appeared on Cuban TV um, to make the announcement. And in the coming days, um, a mixture of responses would filter in from across the world with many vigils and declarations of support for Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution, with celebrations of Castro's decades of resistance to the United States, um, his government's accomplishments in the fields like medicine, public health, education, and the arts, um, often mixed with acknowledgments of, of Cuba's less than stellar human rights record and the faltering Cuban economy. Uh, but on the night of his death, these kinds of responses were hard to see in the Cuban-American enclaves of Miami and New Jersey. Already by 1 a.m. that night, uh, Cuban-Americans in Miami's Little Havana were out in full force, dancing and celebrating, banging pots and pans, waving the Cuban flag, and singing the Cuban national anthem. Um, at least for, for the most public face of the Cuban-American community, and we can come to that um, in, in the question and answer afterwards, sort of the different faces of the Cuban-American response, um, the death of Fidel Castro brought public celebration and catharsis. Um, sales of toilet paper, I don't know if you've seen these, but sales of toilet paper emblazoned with the face of Fidel Castro um, skyrocketed um, in Miami, as did sales of bottles of, quote, burn in hell Fidel Castro hot sauce. Um, many, it seemed, uh, perhaps most Cuban Americans um, seem to agree with Marco Rubio that Fidel Castro was, quote, an evil, murderous dictator who inflicted misery and suffering on his own people. Not surprisingly, the major Cuban-American political figures, uh, Democratic Senator Bob Menendez and Republican Senators Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, all issued public statements hailing the moment as bringing Cubans, quote, one step closer to achieving freedom. But what does this moment mean for U.S.-Cuba relations? Remember that almost exactly two years ago, on December 17, 2014, President Obama um, announced the beginning of a process of normalization of political relations between the United States and Cuba. After more than 50 years, formal diplomatic relations were reestablished, and through a series of executive orders, Obama eased U.S. restrictions on travel and trade with Cuba. While the formal end to the embargo could not happen without, the, without congressional action, which, as we all know, was not forthcoming, these policies represented a sea change in U.S.-Cuba relations. And it's important for us to remember that, that these high-level negotiations, negotiations between the U.S. and Cuban governments did not directly involve Fidel Castro, who stepped down from power in 2006. In fact, Fidel Castro would regularly use, regularly use his columns in the Cuban press to criticize the new relationship between the U.S. and Cuba, writing, quote, we don't need any gifts from the empire, and rejecting U.S. efforts to transform the Cuban political system. Rather, it was his brother, Raul Castro, who had been pushing for economic reforms since coming to power, and it was Fidel who was seen as resistant to these changes. But the death of Fidel Castro happened during the period just before the beginning of the Trump presidency. So what do we know about what might be Trump's policies towards Cuba? So even before Castro's death, um, Trump had named um, a noted pro-embargo advocate, Mauricio Claver Caron, to his transition team at the Department of Treasury which is the institution that's in charge of maintaining um, and overseeing the economic embargo on Cuba. Claver Caron had been the executive director of an organization called Cuba Democracy Advocates, so the DC-based nonprofit that opposes normalization and has consistently pushed for a hard line with the Cuban government. Um, for, for his part, um, 
Donald Trump has made, uh, aside from a couple of tweets, few declarations about Cuba um, since winning the election a few weeks ago, although he had been a strident critic of Obama's policy of engagement with Cuba. And since Castro's death, he has tweeted that, quote, it's so sad. <laughs> <I just> like, <laughs> But yeah, that he's tweeted. This is like how we, how we learn about things. Um, since his death, he has tweeted that, quote, if Cuba is unwilling to make a better deal for the Cuban people, the Cuban and American people and the United States as a whole, I will terminate the deal, end quote. Uh, meaning presumably the set of economic and political agreements uh, put in place since December 2014. So once again, we have the situation uh, where US politicians are demanding that Cuba meet its terms uh, set by the United States government. According to a Trump spokesman, quote, the president-elect wants freedom in Cuba for the Cubans and a good deal for Americans where we are not played for fools. Our, our priorities are the release of political prisoners, the return of fugitives from American law, and political and religious freedoms for all Cubans living in oppression. Um, and for those that don't know, the, the return of fugitives from American law um, is, is partly a, a reference to Asada Shakur. Um, so of course, this kind of approach hasn't, uh, hasn't worked in the past. For decades, the United States has tried to shape Cuban policy through efforts at diplomatic isolation, a 50-year economic embargo, numerous assassination attempts on Fidel Castro, and one ill-fated military invasion. As many have, have noted, this served primarily to justify a hardline stance against domestic dissent, and those that suffered most from the embargo were the Cuban people. So it's hard to imagine that the closing off of this limited um, economic and political ties that have been established um, will do anything to hasten reforms on the island. So all of the recent changes um, in U.S.-Cuba policy have been due to executive action by Obama. The resumption of commercial flights, limited tourism, new business deals, and the reestablishment of formal diplomatic relations. So it's well within Trump's power to turn back the clock and bring us back to the old status quo. Trump could restrict family travel, reinstate the ban on educational programs in Cuba, put new restrictions on family remittances, and direct mail exchange with the islands, etc. Um, if he does pursue this hard line, it could be disastrous for the Cuban economy, which has been suffering in the past few years um, in the wake of the 2008 financial collapse, and especially with the reduction of support from Venezuela, given Venezuela's economic and political crisis. So there is concern on the island that this could lead to further economic hardship for the Cuban people um, at the level perhaps not seen since the, since the 1990s special period following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and it will certainly, almost certainly, play into the hands of the hardliners in the Cuban Communist Party who have been resistant to reforms under Raul Castro. So uh, what are, are Trump's options here um, that we should be keeping an eye on? Um, one, um, he could obviously go back on all of Obama's executive orders. Two, he could keep things primarily as they are, or three, and this is obviously the most likely, is to try to renegotiate the terms of the U.S.-Cuba relationship by using the threat of closing off ties in order to extract concessions from the Cuban government. The potential cost of this, of this strategy, of course, is that it would almost certainly not work, um, as it has never worked in the past. And it would, again, strengthen the hand of hardliners and reduce the chances for any political reforms. Um, but I do think that there's some hope for those of us that don't want to return to the Cold War era of um, a politics of embargo and isolation. So over the past 10, 15 years, um, a few things, key things have changed that might push the scales towards continued engagement between the U.S. and Cuba. I mean, first we have this long process that's been decades in the making of a slow reduction in the cloud of hardline Cuban Americans in Florida. Um, first, um, though while Cuban Americans still have disproportionate political power, um, with three U sitting U.S. senators and outsized power in an important swing state, demographic shifts have lessened the clout of the older generation of Cubans who resist any engagement with the island. So while, while many children and grandchildren of the early waves of Cuban emigres are against any political engagement with the Cuban government, um, much larger percentages of these younger Cuban Americans are in favor of, of engagement. Um, and Cubans that came in the 1980s and 1990s and more recently are much more, generally much more in favor of engagement with family members on the island um, and much more likely to visit the island um, and much more likely to support engagement. And then uh, the other, of course, part is, is uh, over the past few years, the um, increased growth of, of Puerto Ricans um, moving to, to particularly central Florida, which has offset the, the power of, of Cuban Americans a little bit. Um, so second, you of course have increased Republican support for trade with Cuba. 
Um, and this is especially important in agricultural states in the Midwest, where Trump support was also high. So this is another sort of mitigating factor that, that, that might sort of tip the scales a little bit in favor of continued engagement. Um, and third, and to not take up too much time, I'll, I'll end it here. Um, you know, there's the, the hope that the death of Fidel Castro and this generational shift that it, that it embodies might open up space for continued negotiation um, with the island. And uh, finally, with the two planned 2018 retirement of Raul Castro, there might be even more room for negotiation with a Cuba where no Castros are in power. So hopefully, like in the context of these demographic and political shifts that are happening right now, um, some of that might sort of push the scales in favor of, of continued economic and, and political, particularly engagement with Cuba, rather than a, a closing off of the ties that have opened things up over the past two years. Um, so I'll end it there. Thank you, Daniel, for setting up my, my comments because, um, of course, uh, we're talking about the very same set of events and therefore, forgive me if I repeat some of the, the things that Daniel has said for the sake of having some structure to what I'm going to say. Uh, I'm going to approach this in a slightly different way through the lens of the routine of revolutions to try to understand a little bit about, as my way of trying to understand a little bit about Cuba and also about the possible outcome of this present moment. Um, the first and most obvious thing is that uh, it is, Daniel has, has already said it, but it's tried, almost tried to say that there is, uh, you know, an almost irreconcilable chasm uh, between uh, what we've seen over the last couple of days in Cuba itself and uh, obvious uh, instances of genuine grief and what we see in Miami, which is uh, obvious instances of genuine uh, celebration. And the question is, uh, how can we reconcile? Is it possible to reconcile these two things? And uh, I, I think the actual uh, positions are probably irreconcilable. But uh, we can understand them through the, the lens of, of, of revolutions and what uh, revolutions create, which, which are you know, very different perspectives on the direction and future of, of, of a, the country that has experienced these kinds of uh, phenomena. Uh, however, what is also evident is that in vast swathes of the global south, uh, what we could call the former third world. Uh, there is genuine sympathy for the Cuban revolution, and Castro's death has been met uh, widely with sentiments of sympathy. I think of my own Jamaica, uh, which in 1980, Jamaica was riven with uh, you know, very conflictual politics between a democratic socialist uh, ruling party and uh, right-wing opposition. The ruling party was sympathetic to, uh, to Cuba and to uh, Fidel in particular, and the opposition was diametrically opposed to him. Uh, in, in the last couple of days, we've seen both parties, uh, both the nominally right-wing party, which is now in power, and the nominally democratic socialist party coming together and celebrating, uh, not celebrating, but certainly expressing condolences for Castro's death. We've seen throughout the Anglophone Caribbean the flying of flags at half masts through CARICOM, the regional organization, in support of, uh, certainly in sympathy with, with Fidel Castro. The obvious question is why? What has been the sea change in attitudes towards him? And what in particular has been uh, the sea change in what we would consider the conservative part of these uh, countries, which 30 years ago were that were extraordinarily hostile. And the answers are, are also pretty obvious. Uh, the, the Cuban generosity in education, uh, four schools were built in Jamaica by the, the Castro regime. There's a little known sliver of information that Usain Bolt's coach, coach who, who <coughs> basically brought him to world fame, was educated at the GC Foster School, which was one of the Cuban uh, schools. Uh, uh, Indeed, all of the Jamaican athletics coaches were trained there. 
And so the Cubans built a school that led to Jamaica surpassing Cuba's achievement in athletics and becoming a foremost sprint nation in the world. Uh, uh, the Cuban uh, outreach in education, which is unprecedented, 80,000 doctors trained across the globe, um, most of them, if not all, free. Uh, these things mean something in countries uh, like many parts of Africa where uh, education was uh, unavailable. Uh, in many parts of the Caribbean, uh, people who could not afford to go to the University of the West Indies or to uh, North American or British uh, educational institutions went to Havana or other parts of Cuba to the Latin American School of Medicine and were trained. Uh, and most important of all, I think, certainly from a Caribbean perspective, was the Cuban intervention in Southern Africa. Uh, uh, from, from the perspective of of nations which had experienced slavery, uh, the, the Cuban intervention in opposition to the apartheid presence in Southern Africa uh, was considered as being uh, not only liberatory, but if there is any trump card, forgive my use of that term, uh, it was uh, the, the Cuban presence in 1975 uh, and in um, 1988, more importantly, at Quito Quana Valley, which led to the end of South African intervention in Angola and in Southern Africa, and which subsequently led many, many people argue, and I agree with, with the rapid transition away from apartheid in South Africa itself. Having said that, though, one, one, I think what, what has been missing from much of the discussion in relation to Cuba is uh, the peculiarity of revolution, and I come back to this point. Uh, if we think about the revolution and the, the direction it took in the brief period between 1959 and 1961, when it made the transition from being an anti-Batista revolution into a revolution which declared uh, <laughs> itself socialist, whatever that meant, at the time of the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion, uh, then uh, the questions which have to be asked is, are, are, are very different. And, and they relate to uh, what do revolutions need to do to survive? Uh, and this goes back to a more fundamental question. Was the revolution worth making in the first instance? If it is worth making, then it, is, it, it, it needs to do something to survive. And what do you do to survive in the face of a constant threat of uh, subversion, uh, in the face of uh, numerous assassination attempts, the figure of over 650 assassination attempts largely emanating from the United States against the leader of the revolution in the face of an actual invasion, uh, in the face of annihilation ar arising out of the 1961 uh, missile cr crisis. The question we have to ask is, what does emergency rule look like? Um, what does emergency rule look like when your opponent is the most powerful country in the world? Uh, what to ask, to, to, to look at it in a different way. What would public discourse, electoral politics, freedom of speech look like in the United States, States? If, for instance, Canada was 20 times its size in population with an economy and a military uh, many times larger, um, and with one-tenth of the US population resident in Canada and hostile to the United States, well-placed politically, and determined to bring the state down. Such a state of affairs would be corrosive to public opinion. Laws would likely be in place severely restricting many of the freedoms taken for granted today. What I'm suggesting is, is that this has been the character of the Cuban Revolution for 60 plus years. The regime in Cuba can best be described as fortress socialism. It is an emergency embattlement. Uh, however, with benefits in, the air, in areas of health care, in education, and very specific freedoms, the freedom of mobility 
uh, and achievement that comes with education and which has been open to a much wider cross-section of the Cuban population than existed with uh, before the revolution. But it comes with severe restrictions on what we would normally consider uh, uh, freedoms and with a Spartan existence and uh, a Spartan economic uh, existence. If you add to this equation, that is, that is my, my mind game of Canada as superpower versus United States as lesser power, uh, then we also need to consider uh, the history of Latin America and the Caribbean in this period, which is rife with reforming regimes that sought to implement socially progressive policies, what, but were overthrown because in many instances of United States uh, perception of them as uh, dangerous, if not actual allies of their Cold War adversary, adversary uh, the uh, Soviet Union. So we can think about our Benz uh, in 1954, before the, before the Cuban Revolution, Allende in 1973, Manley in 1980, to name only a few where regimes uh, were undermined through the use of avenues available in a reasonably open, liberal, constitutional field. So therefore, uh, if we think about revolution and think about, uh, uh, if you want, realism and the positioning of Cuba, then uh, some form of embattled fortress uh, approach to existence was inevitable once it was faced with the United States that was willing to do anything uh, to overthrow that regime. What is the future? And I come to that in my closing remarks. Uh, with a hostile regime in Washington, and I, and I thank Daniel for his intervention because I think it's very important. With a hostile regime in Washington, uh, I think the future is predict predictable. Uh, Cuba will revert uh, to its previous stance of uh, fortress socialism. Will Cubans put up with it? Uh, I would suggest that within the context of the present Cuban constitutional arrangements, which, al which allow for a degree of mobility, but within the single party structure, um, they will probably look at this inadequate, flawed arrangement as superior to the alternative, that is the economic capture of the island by North Americans and particularly Miami Cubans. <coughs> the more difficult path to consider was the path of the normalization of relations which uh, President Obama was following. Uh, I think there is a real demand in Cuba for a more open, pluralistic Cuba. There is a huge demand for material improvements which have not been forthcoming under fortress socialism and may be impossible under any strict system of central planning. But the alternative, an end to the social and egalitarian benefits of the country uh, and only to be faced with a return of the ancien regime is, I think, one that will be resisted in the immediate future. I'll end there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I want to reflect on Cuba's engagement with the Caribbean by focusing on its relationship with Grenada. I start by um, echoing Bran in pointing to the different response across the Caribbean region to Fidel Castro's passing, um, in addition to all CARICOM heads of state um, agreeing to fly their flags at half mast. They Jamaica's Prime Minister, who is also leader of the Jamaica Labour Party, which was virulently opposed to Castro in the 1970s and 80s, described him as, quote, an outstanding leader who, though coming from a Caribbean island developing state, has had the greatest impact on world history and will be remembered for his passionate speeches in defense of the right to self-determination, unquote. Cuba was a close ally of the People's Revolutionary Government, which took power in Grenada in 1979 until its collapse in 1983. After US troops invaded 
and helped to install an interim government in 1983 after Maurice Bishop and, and members of his government, among others, were killed. The new government withdrew its ambassador from Cuba and closed the Cuban embassy in Grenada. In 1997, a mere two years after coming to power, Keith Mitchell, Grenada's prime minister from 1995 to 2008, and he's also the current prime minister because he won elections again in 2013, paid an official visit to Cuba. The following year, Cuba, um, Fidel Castro reciprocated by coming to Grenada for the first time. This was his first visit to Grenada. And he was met, according to the BBC, by a hero's welcome by Grenadians. Now the questions I'm asking are why did Cuba play such a big role in Grenada between 1979 and 1983? But also, what explains its role in Grenada after 1997, when neoliberalism had come to the fore as the, as, um, the model for, for economic development in, well, globally? What can we learn from Cuba's brand of internationalism as doubts about its ability to engage in this way loom, especially in light of Venezuela's near economic collapse and political developments in the US. In looking at Grenada's relationship with Cuba, to put it differently, Cuba's role in Grenada between 1990, 1979 and 1983, Grenada, Cuba played an important role in education. It was the source of many scholarships, particularly to Grenadians, Grenadians who study medicine. It also helped to provide medical services in terms of the economy, it helped Grenada in its efforts to try to diversify its economy by developing an agro-industry section, sector, sorry, by constructing an international airport to diversify its economy to embrace tourism. In 1997, in the post-revolution um, post from 1997, again, Cuba re-engaged in Grenada um, in education committing itself in 1997 to providing over 100 scholarships, 150 scholarships, sorry, over eight years. Now just to, to say, this doesn't sound like a lot, but the size of Grenada's population is 100,000 people. So 150,000, sorry, 150 scholarships over eight years um, goes a long way. It also engaged again in delivering health services with free eye care, with its, up, its um, collaborative project with Venezuela through Operation Miracle. Um, also was involved in training of intensive care nurses. Again, it was involved in big infrastructure projects like reconstructing the, the um, general hospital. And the question I'm asking is, how did Cuba come to play this role in Grenada? At the time of the revolution in March 1979, Grenada had been independent from Britain for only five years. It was the first of the tiny Eastern Caribbean states to become independent after their abandonment when the British West Indies Federation collapsed and they were deemed to be not viable to become independent states. The US, in acknowledging the shift in power that had taken place since the Second World War from Britain to the US, felt the area to be very much its um, responsibility and its approach to the region which I have come across in a telegram from the State Department to the US Embassy in Barbados was to remove regional integration this is 1979 February 1979 a month before the Grenada invasion um, took place their approach was to provide re promote regional integration as a basis for the region's economic development to support active trade unions and democratic government, to limit the influence of Cuba and other unfriendly foreign influence, and to maintain its military presence in the region while increasing its share of Caribbean imports. An earlier discussion paper from the, the Department of State emphasizes the U.S.'s preference for a regional rather than a national approach to development assistance to the region.
so that when the leader of the People's Revolutionary Government, Morris Bishop, met with U.S. Ambassador Frank Ortiz a couple months after the revolution, requesting bilateral assistance, Ortiz declined his request, informing him that his government's preference was for a multilateral approach through international financial institutions rather than a bilateral approach. The new government treated this as a slap in the face. Ortiz also proceeded to caution Grenada against establishing relations with Cuba. So right from the start then, the U.S.'s approach to Grenada was very much through its security perspective and favoring a multilateral approach to the region. And this was in conflict with the PRG's commitment, the People's Revolutionary Co Government's commitment to address economic and social needs through transforming the economy for which capital expenditure was crucial. And this has to be seen in the context of what these newly independent states inherited from the post-colonial, sorry, from the British colonial government, which was very little. Um, high levels of unemployment, low levels of investment in infrastructure, in education, in health. So Cuba, since I have lots of pages and very little time, <laughs> just to say that Cuba's engagement was very much tailored to the needs that Grenada identified for itself in transforming its, um, its economy. It also went against the, 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 the US and Europe's disinclination to fund big government projects and the move to marginalize government in the role of the economy. The kind of development projects that Grenada had for itself, <coughs> and I'm just saying this, it's difficult to explain the cost for a small country of constructing a huge endeavor as an international airport. Nobody's giving you the money. You can't raise it internationally because it's too vast a sum and you can't pay it back. So when Cuba came to Grenada's aid providing um, technical assistance, um, labor, you know, this was basically what the U.S. was not, and, and its traditional allies, Grenada's traditional allies were not um, prepared to do. And if you look at a comparison of Grenada's education needs um, in terms of what Cuba gave during the revolution, between 1946 and 1970, 352 Grenadians were educated abro abroad. In June 1983 alone, 161 students were studying in Cuba, 18 in the GDR, 14 in the Soviet Union, 35 at the University of the West Indies. Only five were studying in the US. And I'm saying this to just underscore the point that there's a big <coughs> disconnect between what the new Grenadian state thought it needed for its own development and what its, um, one of its major allies was supposed to give it. Now, why has Cuba re-emerged in the 1990s in the Caribbean? I argue that Cuba's emergence is related to the Caribbean drifting back into the shadows um, of U.S. foreign policy after um, the 1983 invasion of Grenada. The U.S. had promised to turn Grenada into a showcase of, of economic development. By the end, by the middle of the first year, um, after the invasion, the support for the budget that the U.S. had promised um, after giving the first third of its allocations, it um, didn't continue to support um, the budget. By the mid-19, sorry, there was also a disconnect between the, the region the U.S. continued to see the region in terms of security perspectives, whereas across the region, um, economic hardships in the 1980s had been seen as at the fore of developmental concerns. And not just Grenada, but regional leaders were frustrated at the U.S.'s continued security focus in looking at the Caribbean. When Mitchell re-established relations with Cuba in 1997, it wasn't an individual action. By 1992, CARICOM, and this was 
in Cuba's special period when it had been abandoned by the Soviet Union and was going through a lot of hardships. CARICOM re-engaged with Cuba, re-establishing diplomatic and economic relations with Cuba, which was very important, and also resisting the U.S. Block blockade against Cuba by voting against it in the U.N. whenever it got a chance. So Cuba, the Caribbean became a very important part in sustaining Cuba um, during that period. I just want to end, because I know that my 10 minutes are long up, to say that Cuba has been moving more towards um, reciprocity in its relations with countries. And this is understandable. When Cuba, Cuba's engagement with the Caribbean is based on voluntarism. Yet, let's take Jamaica, for example. The University of the West Indies trains um, hundreds of medical students. Most of our medical professionals migrate to the US and Canada. So it's not as if you know the Caribbean is not training people to fulfill some of the, the development needs, needs it has. The problem is, how do you get, how do you engage in a system of voluntarism as Cuba does internally to try, try to get your own professionals to address the health needs and education needs of your, of your population. That's something that we have to grapple with. Also, as Cuba is in moving in treacherous on, more, on certain waters with the collapse of the Venezuelan economy, and Venezuela has been a crucial um, support for Cuba, and with possibility of, of renewed US hostility, what is the Caribbean's role towards Cuba? Um, in terms of repaying the tremendous debt that Cuba has, um, that you know, that we owe Cuba, and I, I just think that these are the kinds of questions that we need to be thinking about. Um, and Cuba has given us a model of cooperation that I think is different from anything we've known before, and I think that there's a lot that we can learn from it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to begin by uh, expressing a hope that I hope that this is this uh, forum uh, is one of a series of forums that will be held on Brown's campus, in which we begin to think about uh, Cuba and its meaning, and not just to think about it in the context of the Cold War or U.S.-Cuba relations but also to try and think about Cuba in relationship uh, to the world. I want to begin my remarks with a, a statement that is not mine, but that is C.L.R. James's statement in uh, Black Jacobins, the book on the Haitian Revolution. In the afterword of the 1962 publication of Black Jacobins, and this is what uh, C.L.R. says, on the, the title of the afterword from Toussaint to Fidel Castro. He says, uh, West Indians first became aware of themselves as a people in the Haitian Revolution. Whatever, James continues, is the ultimate fate of the Cuban Revolution. It marks, CLR says, the ultimate stage of the Caribbean quest for national identity. End of, state, end of uh, statement. I want to parse that a bit to think about Cuban revolution as part of a long quest and tradition within the Caribbean for a certain kind of a sovereignty. And also to then end with a, a, a specific encounter in Cuba of myself around the question of Cuba and Africa. I think to begin to understand that specific statement, it is important to understand that the region historically, that is the entire Caribbean, English-speaking Caribbean, Hispanic Caribbean, French Caribbean, that the entire region of the four or five languages 
is a, was essentially a region that was born out of the colonial encounter, the voyages of Columbus, the making of a certain kind of modernity. That is important to understand that the ways in which this modernity expressed itself was through plantations and racial slavery, which means that the actual struggles of the vast people, the vast majority of the people in the Caribbean region were struggles around, firstly, racial slavery, questions of slavery, and then struggles around political independence. So the question, therefore, is that of sovereignty. Sovereignty of the self, i.e., to take over, to not no longer to be a slave, and a certain kind of political sovereignty, what some of us call anti-colonial sovereignty, to be an independent nation state. The Haitian Revolution, for those of you who know it, and would know, you will know that they are in the, 19, in the 18th century, that, what, that revolution began as a dual revolution that began as a slave, a revolution against slavery, and ended up as a revolution which, which created Haiti and an independent black republic, the first of its kind. But I think it's also important to understand there was also something important in the 19th century, not just Haiti, and that is Cuba, and particularly the work or the, the struggles of people like Jose Marti, and to understand that there were the different independent struggles in Cuba, the ones between 1868 and 1876, 1879 to 1880, and then the 1895 to 1898 uh, uh, independence war, which heralded the, in the direct involvement of Cuba, of sorry, of the United States. And so what I think is important to begin to understand about Fidel and to understand about Cuba after the, the revolution is that you, we have to begin to place it in a certain historical context of a revolutionary struggle for questions of sovereignty, which is part and parcel of a certain historical struggles within the Caribbean. And so in that way, if you look at the ideology of Cuba, particularly of the early July 26 movement, and the ways in which they think about Jose Marti, you will see that direct link that they attempt to make. I think, though, it is also important to think about the 1959 and to think about that revolution within a certain world context, not just of the world of the Cold War, to think about three things that were happening. Firstly, was a decolonization movement in the world. That is, from after the Indian independence in 1947 to the African independence in 1950, to of, of Ghana in the, in, the in, in, in the 1950s. Secondly, to think about the formation of the Bangdong Conference in 1955, and then the emergence of the non-aligned movement. And what I think is important is therefore to understand that 1959 really connects to another world current of politics. We think about Cuba, and we only think about Cuban relationship to America. But we don't think about that the actual Cuban revolution connects to another uh, current within world politics. And that current within world politics allows us, would allow us, I think, to understand a certain internationalism in Cuba. So that, for example, to understand that is to understand, is to, is to then see that the 20th century is the American century. To understand that your 20th century in the American century, that the America becomes the, the lake, the, the Caribbean becomes the, is seen as the kind of lake of the, of the America. To begin to understand that uh, there are things like the, the, the ways in which the Dutch Virgin Caribbean which becomes the, then becomes the US Virgin Islands, is bought for 25 million gold, that is St. Croix, St. John, um, and St. Thomas in 1917, 1918. Um, this is a remarkable transfer, which we don't talk about, that this is after the ending of slavery, our entire group of people are bought for, uh, for, 25, million, um, for 25 million dollars. Um, and that to think about the way in which Puerto Rico at the end of the 19th century becomes part of, uh, becomes a certain kind of colony. And therefore, and to, become, to think about the American invasion in Haiti in 1915. So what you are thinking about, therefore, is a certain context within the Americas, 
in which uh, the question of the American century raises the issues of, the, of sovereignty of various nations and how to manage and how to deal with that sovereignty in a period when the decolonization movement is one trend within world politics. So that when Fidel and the July 26 movement comes to power in 1959, my argument is that they are coming to power around this question of sovereignty. Sovereignty in the Caribbean and what does that specifically mean? He receives obviously full support. If you talk to people around who were around, adults who were around that time who are still alive, they will tell you how much time they spent on the radio listening to that, to, to the, uh, the way in which he comes off the Sierra Maestro into Havana and the centrality of that and what the pride that they felt. Um, and I'm talking about just ordinary people, but I'm also talking about political figures throughout, uh, throughout, the, throughout, throughout the Caribbean. Now, he comes to power, or the movement comes to power in 1959, as we know. And by 1965, it begins to host a set of tricontinental conferences. And the way in which we tell that history is that we tell that history without a certain kind of understanding of the actual history of how that tricontinental uh, current actually emerges. The actual e current emerges in 1961. And it emerges with a group of African and Asian countries who are trying to think about solidarities between themselves. And they have to actually have a conference in Egypt, in Cairo, in 1961. And there are three people who are around, who are exiled in that place. Not exiled, two are exiled and one person is passing through. The person who is passing through is Malcolm X. The person who is passing through on his way to the Congo is Che Guevara. And the person who is in exile briefly is Amilcar Cabral. And just think about the conversations that must, must have been happening <laughs> at the, in that particular city. Out of that particular conference, a group called the Casablanca Group is formed with Ghana, Guinea, Mali, and Morocco. And there is a discussion about bringing Cuba into that movement, bringing Cuba closer to what is happening in Africa and in Asia. And so by the time you get to 1965, discussions are happening between people in Africa and people in Asia and people in Cuba around what are the, the kind of international organization that we need to have. What is the kind of internationalism that we have? All of this is separate from the Cold War. All of this is about a certain kind of Inter international politics that is happening outside of the embrace both of the Soviet Union at the time and of United States. And they agree by 1964 to actually form tricontinentalism. And that is, and then the first conference is in 65, 66 in Havana. At that conference, if you look at the list of the conference, the way I like to see, the way I describe it is that Every man, woman, and his dog and cat is invited if you're against imperialism and colonialism. You just have to bark it or meow it, and you are invited. It is the longest list of people I've seen, and it, and it is just two or three people um, who, from some parts, and sometimes in the Arab world, who are, who are invited. But why, what, but what is the ground on which they, they attempt to, they, they form themselves into groups or that they try to propagate? Three main things. Firstly, the support for armed struggle in Africa. So this is not a Cuban invention. It is the support for armed struggles in Africa. And that is part of a debate that had really emerged in Ghana in 1958 at the All-African All 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 People's Conference in which Mandela and Fanon got up and agreed about the business of armed struggle in opposition to Kwame Nkrumah and George Padmore. Padmore and them had led to the struggle for independence through formal decolonization and mass, mass, mass movement. Fanon and Mandela 
in 58, and Mandela had gone specifically to that conference in 58 to say that the ANC was now going to move to the level of armed struggle. So that therefore there was a basis that comes out that says we are going to struggle, we are going to support the armed struggle for, so, uh, for, for the liberation of, um, of, of, of countries in, 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 in Africa. That's important because I think that gives you the context in which Cuba then begins to support armed struggles in Africa. It is not something that is where it is a pawn of the Soviet Union. It is actually a something that has a long historical record and a relationship with Africa that is not something that was built up in, you know, just when Che Guevara went to, to the Congo, but that it has a longer history of a relationship because of the question of sovereignty, which in fact, which, which, which around which the revolution was actually catalyzed. The second thing that they, 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 they talked about was in, infrastructural development. And by that, the, when you read the document, they are very vague. But what they are clear on is that how do we help each other in a situation when colonialism has devastated our countries? And the actual third thing they talked about were different forms of aid. And but they weren't quite clear as to what that diff those different forms of aid were. And it is Cubans, later on in my view, who developed a specific set of ideas about quote unquote aid in quotation marks. And they do that around questions of medicine, around questions of education, and around questions of, inf of the infrastructure. Professor Jerry Augusto tells me a story that in the Angolan colonial struggle, that there were two doctors in Angola at the end of Portuguese colonialism. One of the doctors was the leader of the movement, and the other one was a doctor in a hospital which was eventually bombed by the Portuguese. So that there is a way in which, therefore, this question of medicine and medical care is not a something that was abstract. It's something that we might take for granted today living in this country. But when you have a situation when you have two medical doctors, and that's, you can run, you can talk about that throughout the entire African continent. Then the question is, what do you do with people who are ill? Because illness is part of life. It is not something that is strange to, 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 to the fact of living. And so that this business, therefore, of medicine, of schools, of infrastructure, was, was, some, was I would argue, something that the Cubans specifically developed in their way of trying to think through what does solidarity really mean and what does internationalism um, really mean. The other thing I would want to, to, to add is to think about what then does that mean for the arms um, program. Brian talks about this business of Quito, uh, Quito Carnival. And I would just want to relate one particular story, which is that myself and the former Jamaican Prime Minister were invited to be election observers in South Africa in 1994. And we met Mr. Mandela in long meetings. And one of the things he said to us was, you need to let Fidel Castro know that as soon as I'm sorted out, that we will, I, my first visit will actually be in Cuba. We had known about the battles of Quito Carnival and the centrality of that battle of Cuban troops to the, uh, to the South African. But what is, in tr of what is of interest, I would want to suggest to you all, is this. The actual opposing views around this matter. Because Kissinger came to Jamaica in the 70s and told us, essentially, that we had to find, we, we had to, we, we, should, we should find it a way in which we'd so we would support the UN resolution sponsored by the United States that would condemn Cuban troops in Angola. And when we said to him that the question wasn't about Cuban troops and Soviet Union in Angola, but was really about apartheid, he said, no, that's not the question. And that what you then want to, 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 to think about is where, how, in fact, these two things clash. How a set of understandings about so-called Cold War politics and about a country being a pawn of the Soviet Union and the question of apartheid, how those things clash. Because one of the things that we now know is that Fidel did not ask the Soviet Union to send troops. 
And in fact, the US Soviet Union was extremely upset about him sending troops because they had worked a, a relationship of detente with the United States. And that they felt that this business, this, this, the, in, in the way in which the troops came and how the troops landed, that that would have actually um, you know, created difficulty for detente. Importantly, I think, is that that particular, what I would consider world historic military action, which then brings the apartheid regime you know, close, to, you know, close to his knees because the body bags begin to come home in Pretoria. That that world historic action has a lot of reverberations and echoes. It led to questions of destabilization in Jamaica and so on. So that therefore, what is the point I'm making? The point I'm making is that there is another form, another current of world history, which we need to pay attention to. That that particular current of world history is a decolonization, is an anti-colonial set of world histories, that it has a set of policies about internationalism, that it has a set of politics to it that we need to consider if we are trying to think about in the, in the round or in whole about Cuba itself and about the role, the historic role of Cuba. Let me end with two, two things. Firstly, the funeral of Michael Manley, 1997, where Fidel Castro attends, and where a woman takes up her daughter and sh shows her daughter in the streets, those of us who are at the funeral, and says, Fidel, Fidel, and says to her daughter, he gave us a house. You have to ask yourself, what does that mean at a funeral for somebody else? where the leader of another country is in the funeral procession, and an ordinary person gets up and says to her daughter, he, gave us, he gives us a house. The second thing I would want to, so, to talk about, or just leave with, is the 1999, a group of people are leaving Havana. They are in a boat. They are, uh, they are, they are, the relatives and friends of them are around. And there's a woman there who's a black woman whose son is in the boat. I said to her, why are you crying? She says, my son is in the boat. I said, why do you, what do you feel about it? She says, I come from a very poor family in the country. The revolution gave me education and made me a lawyer. My son, Fizi, does not have that opportunity. He has high education, but he wants more. And so what struck me at that moment was that what you had was a situation in which a generation of people, particularly Afro-Cubans, and there's problem with racism in Cuba still, but a generation of Cubans had, who had benefited from the revolution in a certain way. And that there was another generation who had benefited, i.e. of education, et cetera, et cetera, but whose desire for certain material things and a certain openness, quite frankly, were not being realized and who therefore felt that they had to leave. In my view, it is that tension and within the revolution and the resolution of that tension that will allow the revolution to succeed or not to succeed. And that the success of the revolution is really around two things. One, putting the question of equality formally on the table in a very profound way. And secondly, practicing in an exemplary way forms of internationalism that meant that ordinary people were able to benefit from medicine and from education. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tony. So this is really amazing, extremely thorough. I can't believe that four faculty in this, the last six days, I've managed to pull together these four really different perspectives, and it's very impressive. Um, I really appreciated hearing from Professor Daniel Rodriguez about Cuba-U.S. relations.
Professor Brian Meek on the sort of why Cuba is the way it is, Professor Patsy Lewis on Cuba's role in the Caribbean, and Professor Tony Bogues on Cuba and internationalism and Cuba's role in the world. So thank you very much to all four of you. We now have some time for questions. Um, there's a roving microphone holder, and we'd love to take um, your, your own interventions and your inquiries to this really impressive panel of colleagues. Bashara. Thank you, Jessica, for organizing this. It's a wonderful panel. I have a, a kind of an empirical question for Daniel, and then just a quick comment. Um, loss in the discussion between the corporate media or those who would criticize the corporate media is any real um, information on um, mapping c c Cuban society today? Just, if you can just give us like a quick tour, uh, <laughs> because they tend to be lost in the conversation, and I think it will be important because that will raise issues about the future as well, I, I would think. Um, Tony, uh, I have a picture on my laptop of Che Guevara in Gaza in 1959. Mm -hmm. um, enough said. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, it's really actually, you, 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 very few people really draw this really deep, deep picture. And I do think that uh, the intervention in Angola was supremely important because the Soviet Union was completely against it. And for a small <laughs> island that was Absolutely. so dependent Absolutely. to send 30,000 soldiers, 2,000 of which died, and basically be the, f the force that broke apartheid is just unbelievable. But it wasn't just Africa and it wasn't, yeah. it, it was all over yeah. and it was early mm -hmm. and it was consistent and it was systematic. And uh, that history still needs to be written, so that's just my quick comment. Uh, yeah, uh, it's very complicated. Um, I guess it's super briefly, um, you know, Cuba has been going, is still feeling the effects of this long period of economic transition that, you know, started with the fall of the Soviet Union. And I think Cuba's not officially in the quote unquote special period, which is what uh, the economic period was called. Um, the 1990s special period in times of peace, um, but we're still very much feeling the effects of the special period with the uh, like the collapse of, of the state sector, um, and yet like the you know where where Cubans find themselves within the economy right now, it really depends on where they are, what their opportunities are. It depends on um, the urban rural divides are growing. Um, you've got the sort of the reemergence of, of sort of racialized capitalism in, yeah. in Havana, which you, you very much see. Just in the past few years, um, you have sort of the complexity of these political reform or the economic reforms, pr particularly. Um, so uh, one result of the economic reforms is the reemergence in Havana of um, of uh, racialized class segregation that you hadn't seen since the revolution. So um, it's it's complex um, and. You know, on the one hand, people are, are like there's a lot of support for economic openings, which have been halting, and sometimes they'll move forward and move backwards. Um, people, certain people are, are positioned in ways to take advantage of that, and certain people aren't. Um, is is one way to, to see it. So, you, I have family in small eastern, like rural eastern Cuba, who um, are very much marginalized from like the sort of economic progress, which is obviously entre comillas. Um, and yet, you see in in Havana, like surprisingly, just in the you know in the past five years, like the emergence of a sort of new class of like r essentially rich young people um, whose families are are taking advantage of of the opening trades. Um, so it's so you, you, you do see the reemergence re of a class society happening in Cuba. Um, and so we can talk more about sort of the complications of that in terms of like the political project of the revolution. Um, but that's a, certainly a reality right now. I don't know if other people have other comments on that. No, I, I, I would agree, and, I, and it's a really, I mean, it's a very strange class formation as well, in the, in the sense that what, what you, ha I mean, from the dollarization and then right, you know, right after that, um, that what, <clears throat> what you had was a, a, a way that you had uh, professionals, dentists, I mean, I, I mean, lawyers, doctors, dentists, I mean, that's what I remember mostly. Um, of folks who were working in the hotel industry, 
because of the ways in which you can then get, you know, you can garner U.S. dollars. And, then, and what that then did that mean in relationship to the peso and to and certain, you know, and, and, to, and so on. And the, 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 the tensions, quite frankly, around that. And this is why I say I think the question of equality, mm -hmm. which emerges forcefully as a centerpiece for the, for, of the revolution at the level of ideology, in my view, um, internally, that that is what is, that's what's going to chat is being, is going to be, you know, that's the, that's what may have, people have to come to grips with that. And how you come to grips with that and so on to me is, you know, part of that has to do with embargo and all of those things, but there's some internal logics is what I want to point to that one has to pay attention to. Yeah. I, I just like to focus for a moment on, on the politics of the revolution because in, in a sense, um, uh, the two are very closely interrelated. The question of um, what what is the economic model and what what is the political model which accompanies it. Now, if, if you're if if you're in a moment of crisis, which was at, at the sort of essence of my point, which lasts for 60 years, and in which survival is the main thing, then you organize politically for survival. Uh, and uh, ironically, uh, the the political organization for survival, which is to have a, a this essentially a command politics is a, com a command politics, albeit with structures that allow for consultation through Poder Popular, etc. But accompanying it, uh, ironically, is an economic model of centralized control, which which facilitates a fortress society. Now, you you these things are why the Cuban Revolution exists today. If it had opened up, if it had allowed for pluralistic uh, politics, then there would have been a party called the Cuban Popular Party, which would have been funded from Miami, and which would have pumped money into the economy and overthrown the regime. And the fact that this was not allowed is why it survives today. So the, you know, the logic of, it, of this thing is, uh, uh, you know, was, was, is, was surviving worthwhile? Was the project worthwhile? And that, that, that's a philosophical question. But if it was worthwhile, then it has to do what it needs to survive. Uh, now, now, you take away a cornerstone of that, which is to say you open up the economy for, uh, you know, the, the world socialist system has disappeared. So you, you no longer have the Soviet Union to, to provide you with, uh, to bankroll the economy essentially through cheap oil and uh, purchase of, exp of sugar. So you, you, you put yourself in a situation now where you, you fall back on a, a sort of variant of state and uh, uh, you know, market economy. And the result is that you start to develop uh, what Daniel is pointing at, which is social inequality. And social inequality follows a pattern whereby people who have relatives in Miami mm -hmm. are better off than those who don't. And they tend to be primarily white. And uh, there's also a, a, a racial element to this, which, which follows it, uh, that people who are in Miami are perhaps more white than people in Cuba. And they send back to their families in Cuba, and they start to benefit. And Cuba starts again to look like what it looked like before the revolution. And this is, this is what the country is faced with. And, and so th therefore, there are existential questions here as to how do you build an alternative economy based on equality uh, in a world of uh, global capitalism with no pole of support uh, to provide you with a sort of um, a safety zone, which is what the Soviet Union did uh, with all its warts, which we can talk about, but which it did for uh, 50 years. Okay. There's a gentleman in the front, sort of second row here. Yep. Here comes their microphone. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I really enjoyed all of your contributions. and. I offer this question to any of you because I think you've all touched on the issue of Cuban sovereignty. And so I'd like to put this into a bigger global context uh, and bring it up to the present, namely the role, the potential roles of both Russia and China in, with Cuba. Um, China has expressed, uh, especially in given the likelihood that there might be an increased tendency for uh, an is isolationist U.S. position. So I'm not asking you about uh, what China or Russia might do, but I would be interested, vis-a-vis uh, -vis sovereignty, to what degree do you think the Cuban government 
over the next two years, and then after Raul will be interested in engaging with either the Soviet Union or China to meet its dire economic needs if, in fact, the United States continues to uh, persist with its embargo. No, I, I hesitate because, and I'm the worst person on this panel to answer those things, <laughs> because there's a kind of social science watching, social science watching and prognostication, which I think we have to be very, very careful of. Uh, there's a whole feel of how to, what does the future look like, and you spend a whole set of time sometimes drawing I'm graphs. No, 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 I'm saying, no, I hear you. And I'm, I, I, I yeah, yeah, right. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm I, I, I hesitate on that. So um, what I would, well, this, is what, this is what I would say. That before the, the before even Royal, um, and uh, particularly after Royal, um, that there was a major attempt, and there still is a major attempt, as I read it, um, in Cuba to begin to think about other other centers of power, and and how you can have economic trade, and who we want to invest. Um, in the coming right out of the special period. There was a, Patsy talked about the Caribbean, but there was an actual hope in Cuba right after the special period that somehow the capital, the entrepreneurial class in the region would actually invest in Cuba um, and they would not have to turn to various people. Um, and I say this from a certain knowledge and, and, and discussions and with people, particularly in the tourism sector, about how, you know, how to position. Um, how to position the Caribbean uh, in a much better way. So I, I know, and I, I know that uh, th th there's a way in which people are thinking that if we can find economic partners in China, in Russia, in the Caribbean, in Spain, in Europe, et cetera, et cetera, then we might be able to build, let me use Brad Brown's word, a kind of fortress that would not allow the U.S. to actually flood us. And so that the question of w how you open up as well, right, which is something that we haven't thought of, how you open up the market, and to whom do you open up the market, um, becomes really very important. And I think there is, I, you know, I, I haven't spoken to anybody recently about this, but I, my suspicion is that there is a, there is a, f there is a way in which people, do part of the reforms and the way, so-called reforms and the pace that they have begun, is actually has to do with a set of discussions and within the, the the Politburo within the party itself around questions of who to open up to, and that there are some people who say we need to do this, and there are some people who say no, we need to do you know we need to follow we need to follow that path, and so that's one of the reasons why I think the reforms and quote unquote reforms in fact have been quote unquote I would say stalled in in, in some ways. Well, sorry. I do not think that I can answer the question, but Q, um, China has been very engaged in investing throughout the Caribbean, and I don't think that um, there's a barrier to Cuba engaging with China. What I, I would think, I would echo Tony's question about what is the need, what would be the nature of the engagement, because China's interest in the Caribbean is largely to position itself to access the U.S. market. And if, Q, if the U.S. were to um, close off the openings that you know, we are seeing and moving in, in a different direction, then Cuba may not have as great an interest. Um, to me, the more meaningful question is, what is the relationship between the U.S. and Russia going to be? <laughs> I think that that is a big unknown. Um, or U.S. and China. Well, or U.S. and China, US, anybody. You know, it's <laughs> like, I think that's the more, the greater unknown um, that, you know, we, we don't have, it seems to be very unpredictable and we don't have a clue how that is going to go. Palace, Cuba. Um, just one thing that I would add to that is that, is that China is, is already there um, yes. and, and has been um, for the past 10 years at least. Um, and you, you see it quite clearly in sort of the infrastructural development in Havana. Um, 
you know, I think one of the benefits of the of this of the fact that the United States hasn't been able to up until now directly invest that much is the sort of creation, and I think some of it's quite a self-conscious process mm -hmm. of yes, a multipolar yes. um, set of yeah. relationships that Absolutely. that prevents a uh, unidirectional dependency with the United States. So you've got a lot of Brazilian uh, investment in the in the port of Mariel, which is one of the major yeah. infrastructural Absolutely. development pieces, and a lot of Chinese investment as well. Um, so I think that's right. Yeah. Because it improves the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Just one, one moment, ma'am. Just to wait for your microphone. And they were saying that the Russians, not the Russians, the Chinese were refurbishing the, the ports of Cuba, mm -hmm. which is a big enterprise. And do you know, how could they do that when, uh, if you have any contact with Cuba, then for six months you are not allowed, do you know, to... to to stop at any American port, for instance. How? Oh, and yes. Russia is talking about opening uh, a base. Russia was talking about mm -hmm. opening a base in, uh, in Cuba. A base as a military base? Recently, 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 recently. Um, I think Russia could could want whatever it wants. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think that, you know, we need to think about this in terms of Cuba's basic uh, foreign policy, which is fed by its philosophy, and it, it's Kubanidad. It, you know, it, uh, you know the, the fundamental question is, is uh, what, how can it maneuver in such a way to retain that sovereignty, which, which Tony spoke about, which is at the heart of the whole thing? Uh, what, what concessions can it make to, uh, to international capital uh, that will not lead to a swamping of uh, the regime and its its direction, and that I think has has been the question uh, all along. Uh, in you know certainly since uh, since before the special period, but particularly after the special period, and so so it's it's essentially a juggling match. Uh, uh, I mean, Cuba would prefer to have relations with with five or six major powers each. One building a port in Mariel, one uh, cleaning up Havana, one doing Santiago de Cuba, uh, and, but none of them dominating in such a way that either their capital or their, their national uh, role would, would be such as to put Cuba back in the situation of what it was before 1959. I think that is the, the one-eyed uh, reference. Uh, what can we do to maintain a system that uh, will we'll achieve certain uh, objectives, but which we simply have to have this capital to, to, for it to survive. Um, thanks so much. This is, this is fascinating. Um, so I, I work primarily in Mexico and Colombia, so that's where this, this question is coming from. Um, I was wondering what the role is or will be, um, not to be too prognosticating, mm -hmm. of illicit um, drugs um, in the Cuban economy. Um, I think, so we know in much of Latin America, it's a driver of violence, it's a driver of corruption. Um, the changing of the marijuana market in the US is a really big deal. So I just, I just don't know kind of what the penetration has been in Cuba and kind of what, um, kind of given the changes in the US markets and the changes in the uh, trafficking routes that are going on right now, I just, I just was wondering if there's any, any, anybody knew anything about that. I mean, cur currently the, the laws are very punitive. Um, draconian. Draconian, <laughs> right. Um, so, the, it's not to say, you do, like, there aren't drugs, certainly there are in Cuba, but not to the degree that you see elsewhere in the Caribbean, um, and being an island, there's, you know, a, a greater ability to sort of control cross-border traffic and drugs, so it hasn't been... Um, in terms of a pass-through country, it's not... Uh, no, and, and, and one of the things that we, do, that is not very well known, is that despite embargo on hostile relations, that one area of cooperation for the last 15, 20 years between Cuba and the United States has been with the DEA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Serious cooperation. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, <coughs> uh, I, I think that this is a moment uh, in which may you might want to think about uh, the future of uh, a reindustrialization project for the region. That, uh, you know, if you look across the region, uh, there has been 
this tradition of uh, a progressive politics, a progressive politics that we've not been able to implement. And what's exemplary about Cuba is that they have been able to stand up for their beliefs, to be able to mount the resistance and say, this is what we stand for. Now, the irony is it has led to a level of militarization uh, and the kind of fortress uh, socialism that Brian spoke about. Uh, but when you look at what has happened in the remainder of the region, right, uh, we, we affirm a certain set of beliefs, but the re actual reality that we create is a long way uh, from our ideals. You know, uh, since we're in America, it would be as though uh, the Americans had declared the goal of their revolution was to create a republic, but somehow the international pressure from old Europe had forced them to create a monarchy. This, this to me is the situation that the Caribbean is in. We have these ideals, but we cannot bring them uh, to reality. We're always compromising. Why do we compromise? Compromise primarily because uh, we need economic assistance. We're always in need of economic assistance. We need somebody to come in and create jobs and so forth and so forth. And of course, the price we pay is that you have to compromise your ideals. So I think that you know, as we look forward, this is, this is an opening moment, a very fluid moment. It could go further to the right, or it could go further to the left. And I think for us in the Caribbean, sovereignty, independence, right, can only be advanced if we take our economic problems, you know, uh, you know, with, 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 with a little bit more seriousness. Our goal has to be economic independence. We know we can do the political thing. But our politics always collapse on these weak economic foundations. We've talked about regional integration, but we've never been able to do it. And uh, you know, people say, well, you can't industrialize uh, because the market is too small, right? But you know, if we really, really look at the situation now, we could sh th th there's a possibility of a change. If we were to rethink industrialization with Cuba in the picture, Haiti, and so forth, uh, the question of our economic autonomy, our economic independence, which of course has been the basic reason why we, we've not been able to live up to the ideals that continue to come out of the region. <clears throat> I mean, you know, if you think about it, what great liberal thinker has the Caribbean produced? It's produced a lot of brilliant democratic socialist thinkers, but we've not been able to <coughs> deliver on this democratic socialism. No? So, uh, so basically my question is, isn't this a moment in which we should uh, begin to think about uh, issues of economic independence, but a program of industrialization that would be forward-looking. And when I say forward-looking, I mean something that would, would come about and be going stream maybe in the next 15 years. And why I say 15 years? Because in 15 years, the cost of labor in China is going to be so high that they won't have this monopoly on industrial production that they do at the moment. Okay. If, if, if we start thinking about some time in the future where the geography of industrialization is going to shift dramatically, that, uh, you know, 
the technology of goods production is also going to be very different. Maybe there's something new uh, that we can do here about regional integration and the industrialization of the region. Okay, thank you. Let me ask the panelists to respond oh, no. briefly because we're getting close to our 5.30 cutoff. So I'll, this could be our last question and I'll hear from, hope to hear from each of you. Briefly, I'm not quite sure what Patrick has in mind <laughs> when he talks about industrial development and shifting, you know, China. You know, I, I don't understand what we'll be bringing to it that would make industrialization um, successful in the region. I just want to point out that there are other areas in which we can be successful, which Cuba has done a really good job in. I, I think that we should um, work for more collaboration. It's in the pharmaceutical sector. Cuba is going to play a tremendous role in the production of, of, of new medicines. And I think that that is one area. We have all kinds of fantastic plants. We have all kinds of traditional knowledges of how to use plants to heal. And I think that that could be an area. There's also um, culture and ways in which we can try to get more from our, our, our cultural um, products. We produce a tremendous wellspring of, 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 of culture, um, especially in music, and that yet again has been siphoned off by the North. Mm. Um, um, the example being, what is it called? Tropical house music, uh, a further erasure mm. of the Caribbean. So I think that there are more manageable and very lucrative areas that we can have, you know, low hanging fruit from before embarking on a big industrial project, given our issues of economies of scale, given our issues of very small populations that I think, you know, and the need for huge capital investments. Yeah. I, I just want to say very quickly that uh, w what Cuba brings to the table is this vast reservoir of trained people. It ha you know, th this, this, is, this is just, it, it, it's almost as though whatever path Cuba takes, it has this head start because of its trained reservoir of talent. Uh, it's peaceful, uh, a peaceful society. Uh, and the question really is what sorts of relationships it can develop with the rest of the Caribbean that, you know, will be useful to Cuba. Maybe Cuba will, will, will want to look beyond the Caribbean to Latin America or, or to the United States in, in a different scenario. And therefore, what about the Caribbean? It's cultural neighbors, it's, it's historical neighbors would make it sensible for it, for it to have a, a relationship with. And uh, that is something that we from the rest of the Caribbean need to think carefully about because the Cubans are way ahead of us in terms of the human resources that they bring to the table. So, uh, I don't think it's going to be industrialization because frankly, uh, the notion of industrialization as an engine of growth uh, is already up for grabs in the sort of early stages of the robotics revolution. So I think we need to think beyond industrialization at the forms of uh, economic cooperation that are going to generate uh, the usual things, growth, jobs, etc. cetera. Um, and I, I, I doubt it's going to be that. And Pat's is pointing in some of the directions that are possibly avenues to open up, environment, uh, uh, I hate to say it, but tourism in, 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 in more um, uh, environmentally friendly forms, um, uh, pharmaceuticals, health, et cetera, athletics as, a, as an industry as opposed to as simply a performance. These are areas that cooperation will, will probably carry us forward, but not, I don't think, and I'm open to debate, industrialization. Yeah. The only thing I would say very quickly on this is that the I that Cuba in the 1980s reached out for the rest of the Caribbean around this issue, from airlines to tourism to <coughs> food production, joint food production, to uh, building of ports. Um, that there was uh, extensive discussion 
because the Cubans felt that the natural partners for economic development would have been the Caribbean, not Spain, not, um, not uh, China, not Russia, not America. And the question on the table was how to build the regional infrastructure and cooperation um, between the various uh, islands to be able to do economic activity. What is important, I think, about that is that that moment passed. And it passed because one of the difficulties that we have to say we have in the Caribbean is to think the question of regional economic entities in any creative way. And to the, way I do, the way I like to put it is that, and I come from the Caribbean, is that we, we have 13 or 14 or whatever the numbers of uh, uh, independent countries and 13 or 14 or whatever the number is, prime ministers, and he or she really like to think he or she's a prime minister of whether it is 400,000 people or, 11, or, or, or 11, 100 people or 11 million people, right? And that the idea, therefore, of trying to think through economic cooperation is a difficult one. What instead, what that has been, what, 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 what replaced them, and you just read the newspapers and listen to the politicians, is that the opening of Cuba, this is how it is put, the opening of Cuba raised a bogey fear in people what's going to happen to tourism, right? That, that, that's, I mean, that, that is the dominant strain, right? Rather than trying to think through, because there's a way in which each of us have a certain, what I would like to call, petty sovereignty that does not think through the questions of the region in any, fundam in, an, in any fundamental way. So I don't think we're at this opening. I think Cuba has, I think if, you, if my reading and conversations with Cuban co com comrades and, and letters tell me that, they, they, that because that moment has passed, that many Cuban people in leadership are now looking to Latin America. In other words, the debate was, are we Latin American or are we Caribbean? Those that said we were Caribbean and one that debates that economically this is what we have to do. Since that did not happen, the, uh, the immediate question now is are we, can we identify ourselves with Latin America as a part of trying to think through regional cooperation with it. And that, and, and that, you know, so that is what is on the ground. That might change and shift, but I would argue that's what is on the ground now. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. I'd like to close by just saying it, we're so tremendously lucky here at Brown to have this deep um, fountains of knowledge, um, this range of scholars that are helping us to understand what Cuba under Castro has meant and what it will continue to mean even after his death. Um, please watch this space, you know, keep an eye on the clacks and on Watson for where we might continue this conversation in the new year. And uh, please join me in thanking these scholars for their time and energy today. Thank you.